you already. Um, I'm Dr. Chris Winslow, the Associate Director of Ohio Sea Grant OSU Stone Lab. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, who is um, Sarah Bowman. Sarah, you can come on up if you like. A little introduction to Sarah. Sarah, um, raised in Hinckley, Ohio, correct? Yep. Hinckley, Ohio. Um, Baldwin Wallace for biology, a bachelor's degree. And after Baldwin Wallace, she went down and spent some time in Florida, and I think it was some of the burns that were in the Okefenokee and looking at the mercury impacts on invertebrates? Yeah, so I was at the University of Georgia. Um, okay. And that's where you got your master's, yep. is at the University of Georgia. Um, since then, she's come up. She's now a PhD candidate in Dr. Roman Lano's lab, and she's working on, I don't want to steal all of her thunder, um, but she's basically looking at lead ammunition impacts on species. Her anticipated, so this is the only time you can ask her about it, her anticipated graduation is December. <laughs> but no graduate student likes to ask when they're going to be done. So that's it. <laughs> as far as you know, it's December 14th. Don't ask her again. She's not going to probably answer with a happy face. Okay. Um, the other thing I would love to announce about uh, Sarah is she's two great things. You came up as a grade school student and a high school student and a college student all here up at Stone Laboratory. So you have a long history of coming up to the lab. I would say a, a kind of a, a hidden little passion for the lab and what goes on up here. And the other thing that um, we're very excited about, Jeff and myself and the, and the Ohio Sea Grant program, is uh, Sarah will represent Ohio as our Knauss Fellow this year. And so those of you that aren't familiar with the Knauss program, first thing I'll say is it's very, very competitive. There are some sharp candidates that are being looked at for this uh, fellowship program. Basically, it's for um, graduate students. You have to be enrolled in a graduate program at the time of your application. And you'll look at um, ocean, coastal, and Great Lakes issues. And not just the issues, but working with legislators that are writing legislation related to the oceans, the coast, and the Great Lakes. Um, so Sarah, um, have you already gone and been placed yet, or is that coming up in here November. in November? So she'll actually go to D.C. and spend a, a crash couple days there meeting all of the different departments, and she has an opportunity to be placed with a legislator or executive branch in D.C., and she'll work with them under a paid fellowship for an entire year. Um, so we're very excited for uh, Sarah to be representing Ohio, and she is a stellar candidate. Um, as usual, what we ask our speakers to do is kind of give you a brief glimpse before they even get into their, you know, their PowerPoint, a glimpse into what decisions they made to get them where they are today. So kind of an, a look into, you know, was I always going to be a biologist, or did I want to be a history major and something spun me in another direction? And just talking about some of the things that they encountered along their life that led them down the career path they're on now. And then when she gives us a glimpse into her life, uh, she's going to take us through her uh, title of her talk is Earthworms, Beetles, and Voles, Oh My, Assessing Impacts to Wildlife from Lead Ammunition. So if we could all welcome Sarah Bowman. Yeah. All right. Thanks for that nice introduction. Um, so I actually was born in Parma, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. And I grew up in a tiny ranch house, and we had a tiny backyard. But I loved being outside, and actually my best friend, in Parma, um, behind her house was this place we called the ravine. And there was this rope tied to a tree. And you lowered yourself down this steep, like, shale cliff. And you went down there, and you played in, we played in the creek. We collected crayfish. We collected fish. We always put them back. Um, and that was so much fun. And I think that that was the beginning of loving nature for myself. Um, and then when I was about 12, my parents actually moved to Hinkley, and they bought a few acres, and that was like awesome for me. Um, they had a creek in their yard, and so I would go out there every day after school, and I think I was 12 or in sixth grade. I think you're in sixth grade when you're 12. Um, when I saw a water penny for the first time, who's seen a water penny? All right, cool. <laughs> um, and I fell in love with aquatic insects. I thought those were the coolest things in the world. Um, so, you know, I stayed involved. I was in Envirothon in high school, um, and I just kept really interested in biology classes. And so in college, it was pretty natural for me to be a biology major. Um, and I had a really cool professor who was actually on that wall over there, on the bottom row in the middle somewhere, because um, he's taught up here. But his name is Chris Stanton. And he encouraged me to come up here and take the very same class that a lot of you are in right now, the aquatic biology class for a week. So I sat here as a young undergrad um, in the same seats that you guys are in now and listened to these lectures. And after um, coming to Stone Lab, um, I had to go back to my internship because I actually took a week off of my internship. My boss thought I was crazy to take a class up here. He's like, you're going to do what? Um, took a week off. I went back to my internship. 
and I was sampling stormwater outfalls around the Cleveland area. And wouldn't you guess it, I went back in that same ravine, and that creek that I used to play in, <laughs> that was actually stormwater that ran off of all of the concrete <laughs> in the <laughs> suburb that I lived in. <laughs> um, and you know what, I thought it was so cool that I got to go back there and kind of come full circle, and I realized that I could get paid to do the same things that I used to do as a kid in the ravine, and that was the coolest thing to me. Um, and that's when I decided that after college I would go on to graduate school, um, and I've been in graduate school ever since. Um, <laughs> so uh, without wasting any more of your time uh, talking about myself, I'd like to talk about some of the research that I've been doing over the past four years at Ohio State. Um, and first I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors because they're an integral part of this. And so my advisor is Roman Lano um, in the department of EEOB. And the other co-author is Josh Bryant, and he was a master's student in our lab um, in the Department of Entomology when Roman was still in entomology. And he did some of the work that you'll see today, so um, those are my two acknowledgments to my co-authors. Okay, so today I want to tell you a little bit about lead ammunition. I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of lead use in the U.S. Um, and why it may or may not still be an issue um, right now. So let's review a little bit. <laughs> um, lead is a naturally occurring iron, um, in element in the Earth's crust. Um, it's the heaviest non-radioactive element. There are four isotopes of lead, so if you want to measure lead, um, you can measure all four of these, or you can measure the most common one, which is lead 208. Um, since lead is a naturally occurring element, you can find background levels of lead in the soil throughout the U.S. Um, and so it just depends on the natural deposits and what the concentrations might be. In Ohio, the average background lead is approximately 35 milligrams per kilogram in the soil across the state. So keep that number in mind as I go through this. Historically, um, two main uses of lead was one in gasoline as an anti-knocking agent and also in paint. But these two uses were phased out in the 1970s because we were distributing lead um, across the landscape. Now you could see um, the bottom four uses Batteries are the most common use of lead right now, um, and ammunition is approximately 3% of the current use of lead. Let's look a little closer at the ammunition use, since that's what my talk is going to be about. So right now, there are over 10,000 shooting ranges in the U.S., and that could be public and private. And in 2011, 13.7 million people reported that, over the age of 16, reported that they were hunting in that year. And a lot of this is big game. Okay. So here's the total hunting, and this is in the millions, millions of people. Um, and so most of that was big game, some was small game. Some was migratory birds, and I'd like to point out that um, lead ammunition is no longer used for migratory bird hunting. Um, that was phased out in the late 70s, late 80s, early 90s. That was bigger, sorry. <laughs> so if you look at the loading of lead, um, approximately 2 million tons per year of lead is used for lead ammunition in the United States. And I'd like to point out that this isn't really a good approximation of what's actually being distributed in our, on the landscape scale, um, because a lot of that is actually used in indoor firing ranges for um, handgun and pistol practice. And so a lot of this that happens in the indoor firing ranges actually gets recycled. So that's not going to end up um, in our soil and in our water. So what happens when lead ammunition enters the environment? So here's our lead source, little pellets, maybe from a shotgun shell. Um, they end up on the landscape. They go through a process of weathering, um, and you end up with some lead ions. And today I'm talking just about a terrestrial system, so we're talking about soil today. So come out of your aquatic shells and <laughs> join me in the terrestrial <laughs> system. And so here's the aquatics of soil, the soil solution. And when the lead ions end up there, they can complex with dissolved organic matter. Um, they can leach into the groundwater. Or they can precipitate out into the solid phase of soil where they can be absorbed or they can be sequestered into uh, mineral forms where they're not easily released. And like everything, pay attention to the arrows because some of these processes can go back and forth depending on what's going on in the soil. When we talk about organisms um, that are in in or on or living in close association with the soil that may be contaminated with a contaminant, there are three main routes of exposure um, for these organisms. So one is inhalation, one is dermal absorption, 
and one is ingestion. So let's look a little closer at these. So for inhalation, <coughs> particle size is very important. Um, here we're talking about dust or vapors that a person or an organism may inhale into their lungs. And there are certain particle sizes that will actually stick in the lungs and end up there, and some will actually be expelled. And so particle size is important for the inhalation pathway. Um, and if it is in the specific particle size that will stay in the lungs, nearly 100% of lead can be absorbed across <coughs> into the blood through the lungs. When we talk about thermal absorption, we're mostly just talking about organic lead compounds. Um, so here's the compound that used to be in gasoline. And so um, that was a, an organic compound which can easily cross the dermal barrier. When we're talking about lead ammunition, um, that's an inorganic lead compound, and so it doesn't easily cross the dermal barrier. So one of the most important routes of exposure for ecological receptors and for humans, actually, is ingestion of lead. And again, particle size can be very important. So in your stomach, anybody have an idea of what the pH might be? It could be low. Some of that can depend on your age. Um, some of it can depend on the time since your last meal. Um, if you're really hungry, your stomach might have a lower pH than if you've just ate a meal. Um, but this is really important for organisms that may ingest lead. So if a child eats some uh, lead paint particles or if a small mammal eats some soil, um, when it's in that stomach with a very low pH, a lot of that lead can actually come apart into the ion form, and then it can be dissolved and taken up um, in the rest of the digestive process. And this is a serious issue for a lot of um, birds, especially bald eagles, scavengers. You can actually look at this radiograph, and you can see actual lead shotgun pellets in the digestive system of this bird. And so what happens when they directly ingest these is it really only takes like three to four, and it can cause death for some of the birds. So what happens once lead gets in the body? So once lead is in the blood, um, it can move to the soft tissues, like kidneys and liver, where a lot of it can be excreted by the body. Um, it could also end up in the bone. So lead has a similar charge to calcium, and so it will often compete with calcium, and so you can see it end up um, where calcium ends up. And that turns out to be the long term storage in the body, and about 90% of organisms' body burden of lead is actually in the bone. So again, look at these arrows. You could see that it could move from into the bone, but then it could also move out of the bone, and this can be very important um, during pregnancy because a lot of the lead will be mobilized back into the blood, and it can actually cross the placental barrier, barrier for mammals. Um, so it can move back into the blood, it can move back into the soft tissues, it could be metabolized as well. So when we think about the adverse effects of lead, just want to run through it, it's a big list, um, but neurological impairment, um, problems with motor skills, immunosuppression, hypertension, impaired vision and hearing, reduced reproductive output, tissue and organ damage, sometimes paralysis, and sometimes death. But what does all of this mean for ecological receptors? So what I want to do is give you a little primer on ecological risk assessment. Um, since I'm going to be going into policy next year, I think I need to talk about some of this. <laughs> okay, so what is risk? Well, risk is just a probability of something happening. Um, but when we're talking about contaminants, risk is a factor of toxicity and a factor of exposure. And exposure really depends on the concentration of the chemical, so how many milligrams per kilogram of lead is actually in the soil. Um, and the route of exposure, so are, is the organism inhaling it, um, are they ingesting it, or what's happening in that sense. And I'd like to quote the father of toxicology, Paracelsus. Um, he was the first guy, I don't know if he was the first guy to recognize this, but he was the first guy to write about it. And he's quoted as saying, the dose makes the poison. And this is one of the fundamental principles of toxicology, is that anything can be a toxin, anything can be harmful or cause adverse effects, but really it depends on this dose um, as to how harmful it could be. And so an ecological risk assessment, it's a process where you're defining adverse effects of a contaminant um, on 
the exposure of individuals, populations, communities at various ecological levels um, to these hazardous materials. And so the first step in this process is you go through a screening level assessment. And in the United States, we have something called ecological soil screening levels, or eco-SSLs, if you're into acronyms. <laughs> and these are given as milligrams per kilogram dry weight, so milligrams of contaminant per, dry, per kilogram of soil um, dried out, not wet. And so the EPA used a lot of literature values to come up with these ecological soil screening levels. And you can see that for plants, 120 milligrams per kilogram. Anything below that will be protective of plants. Invertebrates, 1,700 for lead. Birds, 11. Mammalian herbivores, 1,200. And mammalian insectivores, 56. Does anybody remember what our background levels of lead are for Ohio? 35, yeah. So <laughs> right here, um, you're seeing one of the issues with ecological ecological soil screening levels is that our screening levels are lower than our background in many states. But I'd like to point out, as EPA likes to point out all the time, these are not cleanup values. Just because you're over 11 doesn't mean that you need to go out there and take all the soil up and throw it in a landfill and put something else there. Um, it just means that these are for screening purposes and perhaps you have an issue at the site, perhaps you should go out and investigate a little more. So that's what we're doing at our shooting range. So I'd like to point out just a few other things before I get started um, with the heavy data. <laughs> um, is that soil lead concentrations can vary based on the type of ammunition that they're using at shooting ranges. So are they using non-toxic shot that's made out of something else besides lead, or are they using mostly lead? How often are people going out and shooting? Is this just in someone's backyard and they just do it occasionally on the weekend, or are they doing it every single day? And it will also depend on the soil characteristics. So when I showed you the, the slide about the environmental fate of lead, a lot of things play into whether things get sequestered in the mineral form or whether they end up in the soil solution and whether they end up in the groundwater. The soil characteristics have a lot to do with the fate of lead. And then also your background soil concentration. So what's your natural levels of lead like in the area where the shooting range is? So another big term in toxicology and one of the reasons why I ended up at OSU working with Roman is this term bioavailability. And bioavailability is really a term that describes how much of a chemical actually makes it to the site of toxic action within the organism. And so this can vary with soil modifying characteristics again. And also species specific uptake and elimination mechanisms. So this is where you really get into species specific differences. Um, how do they behave? What are they doing out in the environment? What's the route of exposure for that specific organism? And what does their metabolism and excretion look like? So for my PhD, I had a lot of objectives. <laughs> the first one was to look at community level effects of lead on ground beetles. Um, and this was along a lead gradient at a shooting range. So that was the first one. The second one was to look at bioaccumulation of lead, how much lead is actually ending up in organisms at the shooting range site. And so we chose to do some lab studies with earthworms for that. And we also did some lab studies. We didn't see any toxicity of the soils to earthworms, so we were wondering if there were any subchronic effects or some other adverse effects to earthworms. So we looked at the reproductive effects. We also measured total lead from field, co field collected earthworms and from small mammals. And then the last objective is to determine the bioavailability of the lead at the site. So here's a conceptual model of our site. Toxicologists love conceptual models. So if you ever go to their talks, you'll always see one of these. <laughs> um, so we have the soil here. And like I said, most of the lead pellets will end up on the soil. Um, and we have invertebrates at the site. So we have earthworms. We also have beetles, slugs, grasshoppers. Um, Toxicologists also love earthworms because you can culture them in the lab very easily. We have insectivorous small mammals that will be feeding on insects and earthworms and other small critters. We also have vegetation that grows at the site. I want to point out that for certain metals, vegetation can be very important. Certain plants can be hyperaccumulators of metals, but for lead, this isn't really important. However, it's in this pathway because if you end up with soil dust on the vegetation, and then an herbivore like a bull eats it, then the pathway is there, and it completes that pathway there. 
There's also the direct pathway of soil directly from the soil into the shrew and the vole based on certain behaviors like grooming. Maybe they're um, grooming the soil off of their fur and they end up ingesting some of that soil. And then to complete the circuit, um, the organisms themselves can excrete some of the lead and it ends up back in the soil. Um, for most terrestrial systems, you would also include birds. Um, our shooting range site is pretty small, so we decided not to include birds because the birds would be using a larger area, area of use that they wouldn't be spending all of their time at the site. So we chose to go with a small mammal so would be spending most of their lives there. So now I'd like to walk you through the field site. It's located in Ohio at an undisclosed location. Um, <laughs> we're a really nice range owner that lets me do research there, and he's not sure what I'm going to find, so I keep his name anonymous. Um, it's a trap and skeet range. It's been in operation for greater than 20 years. There's lots of lead loading there, and they mostly use lead ammunition there. So here's an aerial photograph of the shooting range. So you can see here, this is where they line up. They'll fire clay discs out here, and then you end up with a lot of the lead in this area called the shot fall area. We also chose an area off to the side that doesn't receive that lead shot as an on-site reference area. And then if you look closely at this aerial photo, you can see that some kind of disturbance happened here. And actually, the range owner decided as a management practice to go in and remove the top layers of soil, centrifuge out all of the lead pellets, put the soil back, recycle the lead, make some money on that, and then plant a cover crop. And so this is the area that I call the extracted area at the site. This is what it looks like. Um, it's mostly grass and prairie species, and they occasionally mow it. We also chose an off-site reference area, and it's at a local park that's nearby, um, and we chose a field there to use as an off-site reference area. Okay, so keep the soil screening level values in mind and keep the lead background for Ohio in mind, okay? And now look at these numbers. So in our main shot fall area, if you look at the total soil lead, we're approaching 8,000 milligrams per kilogram of lead. Remember, the background for Ohio is 35 milligrams per kilogram of lead. So we're way above the background for the state. Um, in our on-site reference area, we also have a lot of lead. So this isn't really, this is our on-site reference area. It's not a true reference site. If you look at that extracted area, though, um, that was part of the shot fall before they extracted the lead from it. And you can see that it's way down here below 2,000. Then if you look at our off-site reference area, I have to zoom in for that one for you. Um, it's below 10 milligrams per kilogram lead, so it's way below background average for the United States. So here's the United States background. Ohio's is right around there, too, um, and it's way below. So to address our first objective, to see how lead, gradi lead contamination along a gradient at the shooting range might influence ground beetle communities, we set up what are called pitfall traps, and they look like this. So these are just transects that we set up in these different areas. Um, and this is what a pitfall trap looks like, and I'm going to zoom in so I can explain it to you. So ground beetles come out at night to forage, to prey on other insects and other organisms, and they run around at night, okay? So what I do is install this cup in the ground. It's just flush with ground level. And then you install these landscape edging lead-ins. So these are the things you put out in your garden to make it look pretty. Well, I put them out in my field site. And what it does is when a beetle is scurrying around at night and it hits something, it will decide if it's going to go left or right. And this actually increases capture efficiency of ground beetles. So by putting these landscape edgings out, you catch four ground beetles at your site. Um, and then you put a preservative in the cup. And we use propylene glycol, which is marine antifreeze, non-toxic. The blue stuff is toxic, pink stuff not so much. Um, so we use that so we're not poisoning any small mammals at the site. And that just preserves the organisms. Because we leave these out there for about two weeks, and then we collect the samples. We take them back to the lab. That. That's a WebEx thing. <laughs> okay, so the first thing I actually wanted to show you was I want you to imagine, there we go, a beautiful orange line that goes like this. So it grows exponentially and then it flattens off. And so this is a, a, species, a species richness curve. And so on the bottom you have your number of samples, cumulative, you collect one, then you have two, then you have three, and you go up and up and up. And then over here you have your cumulative number of taxa. So for us it's additional species that we're catching. And you normally want a curve that grows exponentially and then it levels off. 
But this is what our curve looks like for the first two years. Hey, there's that orange line. So I think that for the first two years, we're still in the growing phase. We're currently analyzing data from multiple years after that. Um, so hopefully we will level off and end up with a nice species richness curve. If you're looking at this, this was a dry summer. We weren't catching a lot of beetles at all, so we weren't catching new species, obviously. That's why you see the flat line there. So for the first two years, I wanted to show you, this is just the abundance of different species of ground beetles at the site. But what I just wanted to point out was that we have a community that's really dominated by a few, a few species. Um, and so you can see that in the shop fall area and the reference area, we end up with dominant species um, for the two years being the same. But when you're wondering what's really going on with the contaminant at the site, and if you're trying to determine if something's going on with the community there, you want to look at it in a different way. Maybe it's not about the abundant species, but it might be about which species can be indicators of certain sites. And so we use something called an indicator species analysis, which groups things based on groups that you choose for it. So we chose the different areas at the site. So we chose the shop fall area and the reference area. So we put our species in. And then what the simulation does is it looks at the abundance of each species in each group, in each shop fall and reference. And then it looks at the faithfulness of that species to the group. So how often does it actually occur in that group? And then it runs through a simulation. And so what we found was that there were five species um, that were indicators of the reference condition at the site. Um, these five here with the orange arrows, those were actually found in both areas, but they were more common and they had higher abundance in the reference area at the site. Um, this species here was only ever found in the reference area. It was never found in the shop hall area. Um, and same, this one was only ever found in the shop fall area and never in the reference area. So it showed really high site fidelity. And I want to point out that most of these species here, um, some ground beetles don't have functional wings. They only run around it. They only run around and they don't usually fly. Um, but most of these species here actually do have functional wings. So if they wanted to or if conditions were unfavorable, they can move to a different area. So to address our second objective, um, we did earthworm exposures in the lab, and this has to do with the bioaccumulation test and the reproduction test. So the way we do this is we take soil from the field. So again, we put these soil cores from these different areas, um, and we remove the vegetation, homogenize them, sieve them to two millimeters, and then we rehydrate them in the lab and put them in mason jars, and then we expose earthworms to them. So for reproduction, you put 10 adults in a jar, you leave them in there for 28 days to do their thing, and then after 28 days, you take them out and you count the number of cocoons that were deposited in the soil. And then you leave the cocoons in there for 28 days, and then after 28 days, you count the number of juveniles that are in there. And you can get a measure of what's going on with reproduction for earthworms. For the bioaccumulation test, we ran these for 28 days. Um, and then we depurated the earthworms, which means we allowed them to sit in a petri plate and clear their guts for 24 hours so that we're not measuring any of the soil that might be in their gut. We're only measuring the, soil, the lead that's in their tissues. And we analyze them for lead. So here's what our bioaccumulation data looks like. And so the, the top line is our shop fall area. The middle line is the reference area. And then the bottom line is a control soil that we use in the lab. And what you can see here is that they're taking up lead. Um, and it's a very nice straight line, and it never levels off <laughs> um, in the lab. So we're not really sure how much lead they will actually accumulate or where this will stop, um, and it will reach equilibrium or what we call steady state with the organism. So another way to look at bioaccumulation is to look at a bioaccumulation factor, or for acronym people, a BAF. <laughs> and the way you do this is you look at the concentration of lead in the organism, and you put that over the concentration of lead in the soil, you get a number. And you want to look to see if your number is greater than one. And for our lab exposed earthworms and all of our different soils, it was less than one. For our field collected earthworms, it was less than one for the reference area and for the shop fall area. Um, it was greater than one in that extracted area, so it's kind of interesting that it's a two there. Um, this just means 
you can look at these numbers and you can see what the bioaccumulation potential is for that chemical. Um, in the regulatory world, greater than five has really high bioaccumulation potential. So you can see that for lead with earthworms, it's not really high. And we're seeing similar things in the lab and for the field collected organisms, minus that guy right there. We're looking into that one. Um, if you want to see actual concentrations of what's going on with the organisms, and this is a goofy thing again with WebEx, um, this is just total earthworm lead over here. The orange bars are field values and the green bars are lab values. So we just compared to see what was going on. Our lab, our lab bioaccumulation test representative of what's going on in the field. And if you look at our reference area, you might say, yeah, looks about the same. Um, if you look at the high lead areas, though, um, you can see that there are significant differences in the amount of lead that we're measuring in earthworms from the field and from the lab. Um, these are different species. So in the lab, we always use Icenia fetida, which is a compost worm. In the field, we caught Lumbricus species, which are those big, like, nightcrawler earthworms. Um, so is this a species difference? Perhaps. But the point here is that if you're going to be doing a risk assessment and potentially cleaning up a site, you may not always want to bring the soil in the lab and look at um, earthworms that are exposed in the lab. You may actually want to go out to the field and see what's going on with the organisms there. When we looked at the reproduction with earthworms, um, so here's our control soil, here's our on-site reference, and here's our shot ball. The main point here is that the number of cocoons were reduced the number of juveniles were also reduced when you look at the shot fall area. When you look at the on-site reference area, we did not see any significant difference um, compared to the control. So we are seeing subchronic reproductive effects in earthworms from the lead at this site. So we've investigated ground beetle communities. We've looked at some of the uptake at mechanisms and reproductive mechanisms in earthworms. But we wanted to see what was going on with, you know, those things with backbones, those vertebrates things that people care about, fuzzy things. So we decided to collect some small mammals. Um, and when we did this, we wanted to look at our off-site reference area, remember the one that had really low levels of lead, compared to the shooting range as a whole. Since small mammals have larger areas of use than beetles, we decided that we would lump all of this together and just do a comparison between the two different sites. So we set up a bunch of snap traps, and we caught a whole lot of meadow bulls. Um, which is not uncommon. This is the most common small mammal in Ohio, Microtus pennsylvanicus. Um, so we caught a lot of those, and we looked at total liver lead and total kidney lead for these organisms. And you can see that, not surprisingly, there was a lot more lead in the shooting range, livers, and kidneys than there was in the off-site reference area. But what does that really mean? So we went to the literature, and we looked at other studies that also did some histology. We found that Critical renal lead ranges um, for other field sites at shooting ranges were around 25 to 40 milligrams per kilogram for kidneys, so we're way above that one. And we're also above field thresholds for renal edema of 40, 47 milligrams per kilogram and 25 milligrams per kilogram. So likely there may be some organ damage going on at the field site in these small mammals. Um, to address our last objective about bioavailability, I'm not going to even get into this difference between the two terms tonight. Um, if you're interested, there are lots of papers on this. Um, <laughs> what we want to do is we want to mimic that whole process of what's going on in the stomach and the, the dissolving of the lead in the stomach. So what we do is, and they use this in human risk assessment, it's really cool. Um, you basically have a Nalgene bottle in the lab, and you can put soil into this Nalgene bottle, and you can put something that mimics the stomach enzymes and stomach acid at a low pH. And then you can incubate it at any temperature, but I chose 38 degrees because that's the temperature of shrews in the wild. You rotate this end over end, and you could choose your rotations based on some sort of physiological aspect. And I chose 16 because a shrew's stomach will contract 16 times per minute after it eats something. And then you could choose how long you do this for. So 30 minutes is the time it takes for food to go into a shrew's mouth and to come out the other end. Then you filter this through a Teflon filter, a 0.45 micrometer, micron, which is, this is pretty standard for determining something that's dissolved then in solution. So whatever comes out, you could assume was dissolved in the, in the stomach, or our fake stomach here, um, and could be taken up in the intestines. Then we analyze this for lead. So when we did this for these different areas, 
we got these values, and I'll show you a comparison to the total lead. So if you look at the total lead values here for these three different areas, and then you look at our bioaccessible lead, you can see that it's a lot less than what the total lead value gives you. And the whole goal of this is to try to come up with an ecologically relevant measure of lead in the, in the soil, because total lead is just not, not telling us the whole story all the time at these sites. So we wanted to take it a step further and actually introduce prey items to the stomach. And so we did that as well. And at least using this method, um, here's the total lead in the prey item, here's the bioaccessible lead. You can see that perhaps lead that's in tissues is more bioaccessible or bioavailable to the next consumer than the lead that's actually in the soil. So the lead that's in the soil might be bound in one of those mineral forms, but actually when it ends up in an earthworm, Perhaps it's in a form that's more bioavailable than to the next consumer. So I'd like to point out with this, this stuff right here, this bioavailability stuff, um, this method is in development. It hasn't been validated yet. So we can't say for sure that this is exactly what's going on in these stomachs of these small mammals. Um, the next step, not for me, but for somebody else, would be to actually do feeding studies with organisms and then get a correlation between the lead that's actually in these organisms and what's going on here. So to conclude, we saw that ground beetles vary with lead gradients, especially those indicator species, and we're looking into that a little more. The lead from field soils doesn't really bioaccumulate in earthworms, our BAFs were less than one, but that extracted area may be unique with different forms of lead after they did that whole process where they removed the pellets. Lead reduced the reproductive output in earthworms, and shooting range earthworms had higher lead body burdens than lab exposed earthworms. So remember, it's always important to see what's actually going on at your field site. We also found that our kidney values are above thresholds in the literature for lead values, so there may be something going on with those small mammals. And our bioaccessible lead was less than our total lead for the soil and for the earthworms. However, we need to validate this method. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my department, um, the Department of Entomology, College of Arts and Sciences, <coughs> and this fellowship, which is amazing. It funded me for like two and a half years and all of the research you saw today. Um, my committee members and then lab and field support. With that, I'll leave you with a cartoon and a cool picture of a beetle. <laughs> if you have any questions, I can take those. If you're we do have time for some questions. Did you study the warm costing by any Me, me specifically? Yeah. No, but there are, is a lot of literature out there with worm castings and contaminants. So you could actually, after you depurate them, you could actually save those and then analyze those for lead also. And people that do um, like the kinetics of what's actually going on and moving around in the organism, um, they would measure that. But for this study, we weren't interested in that. Hey, do you have any questions from online? So something cool about this picture, oh, I don't know if you can see it now. Yeah. So this isn't a ground beetle, this is actually in a different family, it's a carrion beetle, and they end up in my traps, because sometimes those traps get really stinky, so they think that they're decaying organisms, so they'll end up there. But if, okay, this is an insect pin, so if you've made an insect collection, you pin them and you let them dry out. This right here is actually a lead pellet from a shotgun shell. If you look at this closer picture, it's actually lodged in the elytra of the beetle. And so I just, I wanted to throw this in here because I showed my advisor, I found this in one of my samples, and we focus so much on what happens inside the organism. Are they eating the lid? What's happening? Are they metabolizing it? Are they excreting it? But, I mean, clearly this guy can't fly anymore. <laughs> so it goes with this cartoon. It's got some street cred. That's yeah. Cool. <laughs> you had mentioned earlier on in your, in your talk, uh, groundwater, and I know it's not a focus of this, but are the shooting ranges getting any attention possibly on their, on their impact on groundwater? Um, this one, not specifically. So the area that this one's located in, there's a lot of clay in the soil, um, and the pH is pretty neutral, so you're not getting a lot of leaching into the groundwater. Um, in other areas, like there are large um, lead smelting areas in Missouri, and they're having issues with that there. It's getting into streams, it's getting into groundwater there. So they have large environmental cases going on in that area right now. We stand across the country now on, on the uh, allowable, or uh, states allowing lead shot versus lead water versus. Yeah, okay, so for waterfowl, it's a federal law, you cannot use lead shot. Um, for other hunting though, 
you are still allowed to use lead shot. Ohio, you're allowed to use lead shot. Um, California has banned lead shot for any type of hunting in areas that are important to condors. So they've mapped out certain areas that you no longer can use lead shot. And I think they want to take it a step further and ban it completely in the state. Um, some of the wildlife refuges in our region, Region 3, for the Fish and Wildlife Service, have actually, they're starting to slowly creep into that area where they're going to start um, banning that in the wildlife refuges. But I don't think we're quickly going to see it banned across the board because it's a very controversial topic. <laughs> Solubility of lead versus pH. Um, so, like an exact number. <laughs> I just well, know you when you get to pH, does it become more soluble or less soluble? Yeah. So when you reduce the pH, so when you get around like four, you'll start to see it um, coming out of some of the mineral forms. Um, there are some mineral forms that it takes a really low pH for it to to come out. So it just depends on the form of lead, I guess, um, and the mineral form that it's in. So there are computer programs that can model all that stuff. Well, Michael, why is it so controversial? Is there is there a difference if you're using something other than lead in hunting? Um, I think that some people, I, I don't really, I don't shoot. So I don't know if there's an actual difference. Some people say that there is. There's a difference in the, the malleability of the metal. It performs differently when it comes out of the, the chamber. Um, <laughs> yeah, and it's more expensive to use non-toxic shots as well, like a lot more expensive. I've heard a lot of hunters say that they prefer shooting lead shot. They feel like they got a more accurate yeah. discharge without them in the, in the back plots where they did the cover crop, was somebody looking to try to do some kind of phytoremediation? Because I've heard some people say yes, you can accumulate it. Some people say no. Was anybody looking at that, or were they just trying to make a little money back here? Um, they were trying to make a little money. Actually, it's, it's not a funny story, but. The person who recycled it ran off with the money, so the range owner never ended up getting his money. Um, <laughs> but the reason that you want to quickly plant the cover crop, it wasn't to accumulate and remediate the lead. Um, it is so that you cover the soil up so that you don't have birds or other organisms um, in close proximity to the soil. So when you're doing a lot of these sites and you're cleaning up, um, like the Superfund sites, they'll always quickly plant something that's going to grow quickly and cover the soil up so that there's not as much ingestion of the soil. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Take about five minutes to get back, maybe at like seven minutes still, and, and we'll do some introductions and get to uh, our guest lecture, Dr. Richard Moore. Let's take a little break. On the physical chemical properties of water and, and the stream continuum, my father. Yay! Yay. 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 <laughs> nice work. <clears throat> All right. All right, uh, before I uh, uh, present an award real quick, uh, so Roseanne, if you would come up here, if you would. Uh, uh, and we want to uh, recognize Dr. Fortner's been teaching up here for 30 years, and, and Roseanne, we would like to give you, I'm going to set this over here so it's not in our pictures. We'd like to give you the Friends of Stone Lab or FT Stone Lab Distinguished Service Award. Your name is already on the plaque over there. Uh, you are also the only person who has received the Stone Lab Distinguished Service Award. And down the wall down there, you'll find the Ohio Sea Grant Distinguished Service Award. So you're the only person that's got them both. <laughs> and, and, and this says, in recognition of 30 years of dedication, commitment, and outstanding service, the Stone Laboratory and Ohio Sea Grant developing research projects and teaching courses for teachers. You are a shining example of what a faculty member should be. You make science exciting and fun, and all of our students have benefited from your presence on the island. You've inspired many students and teachers and improved science education in Ohio. We all owe you a sincere debt of gratitude. So congratulations. <laughs>
with. I mean, we're not done with you. Okay. <laughs> Come back. But I, I, I was having a discussion with a uh, uh, number of people visiting from Indonesia. I had a terrible time with the communication barrier. We were going back and forth. But then they wanted to get a picture of us all at the end. And the one guy that we were having the most difficult time communicating with, when it came time to take the picture, he was right over there where Chris was. And as he took the picture, as clear as anything, he said, one, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> it's the international language of That's photography. Right. Right. Uh, Roseanne, I really can't say enough about all the things you've done up here, how much you've met to the laboratory for lots and lots of teachers. And I think Lindsay has a, a, another presentation that she'd like to, like to give you. So. Um, my name is Lindsay Manzo. Um, I'm an educator with Ohio Sea Grant, and I'm also a classroom teacher, and I'm a, I'm a product of Roseanne, uh, that is for sure. So she has been up here 30 years, and I'm going to start crying. Um, but I have been blessed to have been up here, um, or at least working, well, actually, no, been up here, and at the same time, at least under her direction in some capacity, for the last 15. So that has really meant a lot to me. So one of the things, we were recently at the National Marine Educators Conference in Baltimore a couple weeks ago. and. Um, Dr. Fortner is very well known in the marine research, marine education research community. And she recently just won an award over there as well. And so um, while I was there, I spent a good deal of time running around to all of her colleagues, many of whom she basically fell into this career and had become very good friends with. Um, and I asked them, and I have reached out to many, many, many different people, past students, different quotes, anecdotes. Um, things that they may that inspired them about Roseanne um, that they remember, and I just wanted to share a few of them with you. Um, because I, when, when Chris said, hey, can you say a few words, I thought, I'm never going to make it if I don't. <laughs> I, needed, I needed a plan. Um, but she has won a lot of awards, and most recently, uh, she was made an, an honorary member of the National Marine Educators Association, which is their highest honor. That was less than two weeks ago. Um, she's won awards at NAAAE, which is the North American Association for Environmental Education, um, also at IAGLER, the International Association for Great Lakes Research. Um, that one was the Jack Valentine and Outreach Award. So she's, she's definitely earned everything. Um, so I've solicited all these quotes, lessons learned, and all these things because I have kept every contact list from every class up here. And so some of these come from Roseanne, and other ones are um, what people have said about her. So here's some things that people have said about Roseanne. Her energy and enthusiasm are inspiring and, con and contagious. She taught me that you always have to get your ducks in a row. <laughs> For some reason, after all these years and experiences, I always keep in my mind that getting my ducks in a row is critical to success. Roseanne really instilled in me the sense of the power of careful planning and being mindful of details, details, details. It's one way a person can get so much done in a short period of time. She's an inspirational role model for many teachers across the country. She really has her ducks in a row all the time. Um, she's still my prime example of a solid planning teacher who really is in touch with so much, and her ducks are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because of uh, Dr. Fortner that I pursued my PhD. Without her example in my life, I don't think I would have ever gone this far. She's been deeply admired for her commitment to environmental education, to research excellence, and her integrity as an individual. I consider myself extremely fortunate to have known her. She will always be a role model of how to be an environmental and academic leader as well as a supportive mentor and friend. Her energy and commitment to quality education and zest for life would be remarkable for someone brand new to their career, yet Roseanne never seems to tire. She has worked harder in retirement than most of us have in the last few years. <laughs> you should understand that as well. <laughs> She's been an amazing mentor, even to crazy grad students. When I was fairly, uh, this is from a person who was a doctoral student, um, was talking to Roseanne at a conference and asked for advice. Did not really, Dr. Fortner didn't know who she was, she was busy with her own things, but she took time out of that busy conference to chat with that student and um, provide her with additional papers and advice on publishing them, and she will never forget that to this day. Another student said she's long been one of my heroes. I think of her as a pioneer, being a mom, a teacher, a scientist, and a scholar, always uh, at once, yet always up for a good time. <laughs> um, she made Great Lakes education real. She was my first teacher at Stone Lab, and she made such an impression that I took two more classes after that. Um, I like this one. I know I'm a student of Roseanne because I have the Great Lakes song on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> after I got that, I'm like, I really should have said, I, I know I'm a product of Roseanne because, and just had people fill that in. 
Um, her efforts are still and always will be making an impact. Um, and I have to tell you, the number of emails I receive where people have given you credit for their success on the Great Lakes quiz, it was floating around Facebook for a while because they knew the real story behind the Lorax. Oh, I had like 10 people credit you for that. So here's a few quotes from Roseanne to end up, to, to finish up here. Publish, publish, publish. <laughs> uh, what we heard today, actually, there's always a need for education. Make your bath last. Yeah. You can never pay back the people who have helped you in your career, but you can pay it forward. See what you get when you publish. <laughs> um, this is one of my favorites. I, this is a hard one for me. I'm going to die with my slippers on, and even though it will be in a salty environment, it's up to you people here to keep the momentum going on the lake. It's one of my favorites. Someone else said I wouldn't be half the educator I am without my role model. Without her as my role model. Um, I wrote, I'm not going to clean this up. I wrote a recommendation for Roseanne for an award a few years ago, and this is how I concluded the recommendation, and I thought it was fitting for this as well. Gas and ferry charges to get to film lab, hundreds of dollars. Master's degree from OSU, thousands of dollars. To have the woman who is the epitome of Great Lakes education be my teacher, my advisor, my mentor, my colleague, my hero, my friend, is priceless. And she really is. She is very. back from Annapolis. <laughs>
And this is a, a, a boy from Warren, Ohio, I believe, is, is where, where you started out, ha uh, Holland High School. Uh, mastered in anthropology from Ohio State and then went to uh, Texas and actually taught at Southwest State Texas, or Southwest, Southwest Texas State, and uh, uh, was tenured there uh, before he came to Ohio State. But while he was at Southwest State Texas, Texas State. Uh, he was also working on his PhD at the uh, uh, University of Texas, Austin. Got that at the same time he was getting tenure and tenured at another college, and then came back to Ohio State. Uh, I think we're incredibly lucky to have him at Ohio State working on. Uh, you, you are, I believe, the the holder of the largest grant that I've been. Uh, See, come in through sort of an environmental area, a twenty million dollar grant that uh, <laughs> gets your attention. Uh, when you're talk, talk, talking big, big, big numbers. Uh, I've asked uh, Richard uh, when he comes up. Same thing that we talked with uh, Sarah about. He tell us a little bit about his background. So, how did you go from uh, Holland High School in uh, uh, Warren, Ohio, to DePaul, and to Texas, and Ohio State, and anthropology, and speak Japanese, and uh, you know, what, what happened to you? What was in the water in Warren, Ohio? <laughs> uh, join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Richard Moore. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. You know, this is uh, Stone Lab. It's, it's, we're so lucky to have Stone Lab. It's just such a precious uh, resource for the Great Lakes, for Ohio, for OSU. Um, well, just a word about uh, the, the, the water in Warren, Ohio, I guess. Uh, Mosquito Creek, I grew up on Mosquito Creek and, uh, in Warren, Ohio. But, um, well, it's just one of those, uh, those things that somebody came to my high school and started talking about uh, international understanding and being a rotary exchange student. And I knew some rotary exchange students at the time. And, I thought, well, I just remember a red-blooded American Ohio boy from Warren. I thought, well, maybe I'd like to go to Sweden for the women, and maybe <laughs> Germany for, you know, because I had some relatives, and Australia because they were good at Davis Cup tennis that year. And then they had a little other box, which is the sucker's choice. And I checked it. If, if the first three choices aren't available, would you be willing to go anywhere else? And then you take that application and put it over to the side because we've got, got one that we can put in anywhere else. And, and so I got Japan. I thought nobody wanted to go to Japan. Now it's pretty popular, but that time nobody, I got Japan. I, well, where's that? You know? And, uh, and I, wasn't, I wasn't that good in language. Actually, I was 10th I was out of my class of 200 in language aptitude. Cut from the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, so I wasn't good. They said, take Latin because that's the easy one. You know? And so, but anyway, I, so I, I got over to Japan, didn't speak the language, and I was lucky to have a high school teacher that, that was my advisor there. And he, he put me in an elementary school for three months. So I started with, what is this in Japanese? Learn, learn how to speak it from there. But I <laughs> took, took it in every year of college and so on. But, so that's how I got over in, in, in Japanese studies. And then, I went into anthropology later because after I had that experience, I went, wow, this is really a different culture, you know, and really, uh, you know, uh, appreciated it and uh, wanted to learn more about it, so I, I majored in anthropology. And I fell in love with it, and then in grad school, then when I was doing my PhD, I wanted to go back to the same place, and I studied rice farmers in Japan in an upstream, downstream kind of scenario, and that's how I got into water. Uh, and uh, so. Uh, and that took me <laughs> to the anthropology department here, I guess, at Ohio State. And um, so in the anthro department, then uh, my department decided to change its focus. And so then the College of Ag, I, I had, uh, while, I was, while, I was an, while I was an anthropology student, actually, I, I was introduced to the, to the work of E.P. Odom, um, Eugene Odom, who wrote the book Fundamentals of Ecology. And that just took me, and I was like, well, I want to do this. You know. And you don't have to be a biologist to do that. You can be from any discipline, being an ecologist. And so then I, uh, you know, while I was um, actually on the way to be, you know, I was at Southwest Texas State teaching, I took a course from H.T. Yoda, his brother, uh, uh, who, uh, who uh, influenced people like Bill Mitch. You know, him, maybe some of you know him. Um, Jay Martin, too. Both of them had, had uh, um, H.T. Yoda. I worked with them. But... Uh, 
So anyway, and I was in the Anthro department and they started shifting directions, so I came over to the College of Ag. So I followed my passion of what I wanted to do. I, I met up with some, some ecologists uh, in the College of Ag and, and who had wanted to study Ohio and, and so I well, I've been studying Japanese farmers, <laughs> I don't know how to do an ecology over there. I thought, okay, let's just see if we can focus back on Ohio. And so we started studying the Amish. I started studying with Deb Steiner um, and Ben Steiner, uh, who um, are ecologists. And uh, that took me pretty much to where I am now. And they, at the university, they started looking after I started doing that, we started getting some grants. Uh, then when I was in, uh, later on, they had, uh, they were looking for somebody that had expertise both in uh, the arts and sciences as well as College of Ag, somebody that could bridge across different colleges. And then they were looking around, there weren't too many people that had been in different departments and different colleges in the university. And so uh, they asked me to serve in the position I'm in now. So that's sort of how I got to where I am now. <laughs> so thanks for asking. My, I guess what I'd say is, you know, follow your passion. When we, uh, when we first started, when Ben and I first started looking at watersheds in Ohio, and you know, we didn't know anything about it. People, we really got some, some people going like, what are you guys doing looking at watersheds? You don't know anything about watersheds. And we go, yeah, teach us everything you know. Just take that attitude about things, and you can start at that point. You know, it was, I don't know, a number of years later, we had the top-ranked USDA watershed grant. So um, time this year of testifying to Congress. So, you know, you can, you can come a long way for having not known anything about watershed. <laughs> so, uh, just, just remember that. Anybody can do it. Even a guy who's, you know, ranked 10th from the bottom <laughs> in language aptitude. So, uh, with that then, let me uh, talk a little about something called water quality trading, which I've really become involved in. Um, water quality trading was created under the Bush administration in, in 2003, it's a rule under EPA, and it's a way uh, that you can have trading of credits between a point source and, um, and a non-point source, or between a point source and a point source. And a point source is um, like a wastewater treatment plant or an industry, something that has a pipe going out of it. And a non-point source, is something where you can't really identify where the source is from. Um, very typically, non-point sources are farmers. Um, so that's the basis of it. Um, what it really connects with, though, is the permit permitting system that EPA has uh, for point sources. So uh, back when EPA was created, remember after the Cuyahoga River burned in the 70s, uh, the EPA was created. Uh, they, for one of the first things they focused on after the Clean Water Act was, uh, was creating this system called National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System, or NPDES system. So, and they've really made a, a lot of progress. You know, we've, you've probably heard about the Great Lakes and lowering the total phosphorus level. That was largely through this permitting system of gradually, you know, having all these, these permits. They're five-year permits. Every pipe has one coming out of every wastewater treatment plant. And they uh, then you know, had the limits of phosphorus, and they had them at, at five and then at, at milligrams per liter. Then they lowered it down to three milligrams per liter concentration. And now it's pretty much one milligram per liter concentration. So gradually decreasing like the phosphorus that would go out of those pipes into the stream and into Lake Erie. It made a, it's been a very successful program overall. Um, and in the future, it probably will lower the phosphorus li limit down to 0 0.5. It's, uh, probably just a few years away from that. So water quality trading, what's good about it? When you, sometimes people first hear it, they go, oh, well, somebody's going to get off the hook. You know? uh, but more conservation gets done than if the permit holder followed the permit. So you have a permit, and in a permit, it'll say what you have to have as far as your regulation, how much your limit is. And they'll tell you, what your, you know, how much flow can come out of your pipe. So. The trading, and so that's the, the first thing. More conservation gets done. Second thing, and part of that is it's accomplished through a trading ratio. So it's not like a one-to-one -one kind of trade, but it can be a two-to-one or a three-to-one kind of trade. So for every pound that the, of credit that the, that the point source gets credit for, um, maybe three pounds of conservation is put on, like in, on a farm. It's, 
so that they conserve that off of a farm. Um, or the other thing that happens um, is that there may be a permit on phosphorus, but when you put the conservation measure in on the farm, you're actually remediating nitrogen and phosphorus, but we're not actually interested in the nitrogen part of it because the permit, the trading is only going on in the phosphorus, but we're actually remediating nitrogen as well. The other thing is, it's very popular, it doesn't cost you the taxpayer anything. And so right now, most of our conservation measures are coming through the farm bill, but you pay for them, you are the taxpayer because it came out of the national government uh, financing system. Uh, so in this case, the polluter pays. In other words, the permit holder pays for this trade. They pay, say, farmers to put in conservation measures. And last, you might say, well, they're getting off the hook, aren't they? No. Every five years, these permits are only good for five years, so every five years the permit has to be renewed. And if it fails, the permitter is liable. They're held accountable for this. So Ohio, our rules are three to one, basically. In other words, if you're, if you're a, uh, a wastewater treatment plant and you want to uh, get credits, you'd pay a farmer to put in some conservation measures. And in, for every three pounds they put in, you could, would get credit for one pound in most cases. There's some other, some other rules, but, I mean, but that's basically it. Um, <clears throat> some ways that this is accomplished. Um, you could, you could uh, on the farm, you might convert uh, conventional tillage to reduced tillage um, or no-till. Uh, anything to reduce the tillage normally will, will mean that there's less runoff and less phosphorus, uh, for instance, that gets into the stream. Or filter strips or contour, con uh, crop contouring, any way to slow down water. Um, if cows are... Um, uh, letting things go in the stream, uh, then that would also, you know, their uh, manure, urine uh, would have an effect. So fencing cows out of streams, uh, or in this case, very limited access to a stream would mean it would be reduced. Uh, there's ways, for instance, in better, um, better uh, managing our fertilizer inputs. Uh, so having soil tests in the spring on different places, different parts of a farm, um, we can do that through um, uh, testing. Uh, there's, there's even an insurance program where you can tell a farmer, you think, hey, why don't, why don't you reduce your, your nitrogen uh, inputs or phosphorus inputs by 10%, and if your yield has really decreased that much, we'll give you some insurance to make sure that you don't lose out. Um, there's late spring nitrate testing. There's cover crops that can be put in. A cover crop is a crop, a crop that you might put in after... Um, uh, let's say if it's corn and soybeans, after that you might put in uh, a crop of rye. Uh, uh, um, so uh, that might be a, a cover crop. Um, it, urbanites can also do things to, um, to reduce their, um, the amount of phosphorus and nitrogen that they um, have go out. Where you might have your town uh, put a limit on what kind of fertilizer can be sold. For instance, Scott has done that where they're reducing the amount of, of phosphorus now that they sell in the state of Ohio. So uh, that kind of thing happens. And, and uh, so that you could get credit for that in a water quality trading plan or the idea of rain gardens and rain barrels. Like the, there's some uh, towns in Oregon, for instance, which have that built into the, to their utility um, bills so that you could get a reduction on your ut utility bill by having this. Um, having different alternatives to impervious surfaces and uh, diverting stormwater. Actually, the stormwater part of water quality trading is one of the frontiers trying to be able to, because we need to quantitate uh, what happens, and um, they're still in the, doing a lot of work on trying to quantitate what happens with regard to phosphorus and nitrogen with regard in stormwater. But those are urban uh, uh, measures that can be uh, done. Wastewater treatment plants themselves can, can do a lot of things. For instance, um, they could take, after they treat, when you have a limit on a permit, let's say it's, it's in, in most of the, of the wastewater treatment plants for, that go into Lake Erie, it's one milligram uh, per liter concentration. Well, after it's treated down to that level of one milligram, then it goes back into the stream, right? So it would be possible, though, to take that and then reapply that to a field some way, if it was safe, of course. There's a lot of ifs that you can you know, put onto that. But if we were able to do that, um, 
than in water quality trading in such a case, um, because that's a point source, we can trade a point source and a point source under Ohio trading rules on a one-to-one -one basis. But it has to be that they would have to go, um, they could trade them, uh, you trade downstream basically. So, um, and then the other way might be to make a fertilizer product out of some of, some of that that's left over. Um, so, called struvite. Well, we need a 40% reduction for Lake Erie, so um, anything uh, that we do would be helpful. And this isn't the silver bullet, but it's, eh, it's a kind of, of help anyway, I can say that. One of the most important questions, though, in water quality trading is who benefits. You can make it. I can make up a plan. You can make up a plan. Um, a coal burning power plant can make up a plan. Um, local community can make up a plan. So all of the above happens. <laughs> and so you do get into some politics. When we first started doing this, I had no idea that I would be up against the coal burning power plant at some at one point, but I was eventually. Uh, and so that was it's been an interesting ride. Um, so let me tell you about a couple uh, interesting cases of water quality trading, what I consider to be um, uh, success cases. Uh, Willamette Partnership is an interesting one. This is out in Medford, Oregon, where a, a, um, a power plant was heating up the, the water too much, and it was affecting uh, the, uh, the fish, salmon spawning, and so on. So they were able to make a deal uh, with EPA and put in uh, improved riparian corridor on the stream such, so that it would cool the stream more to make up the difference of what, what they were doing. And again, it was done through a ratio, and so at the end of the day, you have happy fish. Uh, and so um, that was uh, a very successful one recently. You can, you can look it up if you're interested in, I think it's called the uh, Freshwater Alliance um, or Willamette Partnership. Another one is the one that I created, I, I wrote, uh, which is called Alpine Nutrient Trading Plan. Uh, which is for a cheese factory um, and based on phosphorus trading. And it was um, somebody else at the, at the uh, hearing in Washington when I testified called it the poster child of water quality trading. So I, I wasn't the one that said it, but I'll be glad to repeat it. Uh, so, <laughs> but anyway, uh, this one, uh, the, the EPA was ready to shut down the cheese factory and they had very high levels of phosphorus, over 200 milligrams per liter, with a permit of one that <laughs> they had to get down to. And EPA said, enough's enough, you know, and we're going to close you guys down. And both they, they and the EPA came to, uh, to, uh, to me and asked if we could do it. And naively, I thought it was a weekend product project, uh, and here I am still working on it. But and that, that was in the year uh, 2007. So um, here's some of the kinds of things. Ohio is actually a leader in water quality trading. We have a number of experiments going on here. Um, a little hard to see from the colors, but um, Alpine is the one that's a little bit, uh, oh, I got a pointer here, um, a little bit in um, gray, green here. And uh, we also have a wastewater treatment plant that, that's also covered in the, uh, so we have actually two things here that are on that uh, plan. Uh, and uh, so this, was, this is where we started, and it became a success uh, story, and then what happened was um, this was mainly in Holmes County, and this is Wayne County. So Wayne County said, well, we want to get involved in this. And so we said, okay, and we started talking with others around there. And, and then the surrounding counties said, well, we want to be part of it too. And before we knew it, 21 counties in the Muskegon watershed all said, we want to be part of it. And uh, not too often the 21 counties come together. And one thing that was really popular, again, was that, you know, that your taxpayer dollar didn't, you know, didn't, uh, um, wasn't involved. It was just the, the companies, and and so um, very popular. And we paid for everything, the uh, the the, the, the labor at the local soil and water office. We added a whole position uh, from from that paid by the company. Uh, and um, at the same time, many of these local county soil and water district offices were um, suffering from the uh, from from financial uh, reductions in their local budgets and cutbacks and so on and so. Holmes County was the only one to say, hey, we just added somebody. You know, we're getting more conservation done. Um, so that's one project. And then another one that I was involved in with Brent Sanjan was a study of, of, of Upper Scioto. Well, here's uh, Columbus in Franklin County. And this area it starts down in Circleville and goes north. Of course, it goes all the way down to the Ohio River, as does this one here. The Muskegon watershed goes down to Marietta, whereas the, uh, the Scioto watershed would go all the way down to Portsmouth. 
Uh, and so we did a study there on, and to trying to see whether it would be feasible, and we think it's feasible. Um, and then uh, the, another one that started about the same time that the Alpine did in 2007 was the Great Miami Watershed. And it was based on a large um, municipal of uh, the city of Dayton's wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and their organization was quite different than ours. Uh, theirs, uh, uh, it was, it was uh, led by the um, Miami Conservancy uh, wa uh, group, uh, a watershed group uh, that manages this watershed. Uh, and they created something called a reverse auction. And a reverse auction means the lowest price wins. So if you bid for something, usually you know when you make bids, they keep going up and up and up in price. Well, in this case, you go down and down and down in price. So the lowest bidder wins. Uh, so in this case, how much, what's the price you can, you know, you, per pound of phosphorus reduction would be the, what people were bidding for. Uh, so farmers would put in bids for, okay, I can do 100 acres of a cover crop for this price, and that would, they could do equations for how many pounds that would reduce. And so then they would bid on the prices like that. So as expected, the price kept going down. Um, and um, quite opposite to our approach, which was very community-based, and we tried to keep a, a county in control of its own um, water. Even though we created a large system, it's basically county, county uh, favors each county uh, being controlling their own, um, their own situation. And so then there's another one by EPRI. Remember I said coal burning power plants. This is the, ener the electric power Research Institute, which really represents the coal burning power plants, and so they tried to do an interstate trading, which they did successfully right here between um, Ohio. Its watershed actually goes over to Pennsylvania. Of course, watersheds don't, uh, just like Lake Erie, they don't have, you know, they don't pay attention to, to boundaries. You know, they, often boundaries are established because of them. But um, and so uh, you have then a watershed that has multiple um, administrative uh, entities involved in it. So. Uh, that's what's going on in Ohio. It's a, we're a national leader. So here, tell me, I'll tell you a little bit about, um, about this. We were actually influenced by another, um, uh, a, uh, the South Nation Ontario project. Most people don't know about this, but they, this is on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And uh, they had a very successful plan, but it was led by the Ontario government. And one thing we really liked about it that we learned uh, was far, they put farmers uh, up front and, they, and farmers taught other farmers. We really liked that idea farmers teaching other farmers. And, um, and they also weren't focused just on price. Remember I said that other trading program was focused on a reverse auction in price. And I'd always, I get these calls all the time by uh, you know, different national groups that want to say, what was your price for phosphorus? How many dollars per pound? I said, well, that really, <laughs> we were just trying to save a cheese factory. That was a question we asked afterwards, you know, after it was successful. And we, so that actually got my head scratched. And remember, I'm the guy that was 10 from the bottom. So I still have sometimes plan these things out, you know, from the very beginning. But sometimes afterwards, I go, okay, how do we do that? <laughs> you know, why did it, why did it work? And so um, it was actually only after the fact. And it, it was very expensive. We did it expensive. It, it, was, it cost a lot. But so did theirs. And theirs was also successful. So maybe that's a hint of something about it. Um, You'll learn more about that in a minute. Another person is this guy named Sabatier. He, uh, we learned a lot about him too. His, his idea was collaborative partnerships. And so, um, you know, there's different ways to do watershed, water, watershed partnerships. And, um, and one way, for instance, is, oh, we've got to be democratic and we, got, we have to have a member of every possible group, demographic group. Another one is, okay, let's get the people in there that can really make a difference and change something. So, when we started Sugar, the Sugar Creek Project in, Holmes, in Wayne and Holmes County, we worked with a bunch of farmers, and they just said, well, we want to make changes, and we hope everybody else will do something too. And they sent letters out to their surrounding people that surrounded their farms and said, we're going to make these changes, but we thought you'd like to know. Didn't ask them to join. They said, we're going to make these changes. And in a very you know, humble German way, they were able to, to get the message across. Um, and they did make changes. Uh, so. Uh, in, in that kind of way that, you know, they decided uh, that they could make a difference on their land. And, uh, and so it was sort of this advocacy coalition. Kind of thing. Um, so here, here's the Sugar Creek Project and the Alpine Project right here. And, oops. Um, and the, this is the Muskegon Watershed. So this is the success case. And we started here and this one. And, right, and this was approved by EPA as a trading plan. And, the, the re whole rest of it is in the final stages of being approved by EPA. And that takes a lot of work to get something through the EPA bureaucracy. Um, so the, this is what the cheese factory looked like. 
and they were putting um, their effluent went into a um, stream that would go underneath this parking lot into the middle fork of Sugar Creek. And uh, so there were over 200 parts per million. They had the EPA agreement was to get down to three and then we would trade between three and one. So they didn't get off the hook here. They had to do a partial uh, facility upgrade to get all the way down from over 200 down to three. Uh, and but it turned out that the last two parts per million were as expensive as, the fir as going from all the way from 220 down to three, mm -hmm. because it's those last couple that are really, when you get to those last couple parts per million that are so expensive. That's another point to remember. But what we had on the line here was that this chief, if this factory could expand, they would have 12 new jobs and local milk demand of 250,000 pounds per day, huge for the local economy. So after the fact, we go back and we think about this thing. We said, gee, wouldn't have you wanted to do this anyway? Because it would, it would really help the local economy. And it would pay for this thing in a day anyway. So back to the price. Was the price per pound all that important? No, I don't think so. So that's sort of what it looks like. You know, so we started up at 220-something and down to three. Had to get down to one. But, you know, so, and then... I mentioned here, added nutrients removed through conservation. So all the nitrogen, which is all focused on, ant, on P, phosphorus, but we also got, for every pound of phosphorus, actually we, we remediated two pounds of nitrogen. So huge. Um, so basic facts, really small. It was 0 0.14 million gallons per day operation. So it's a small operation. There's a hint of why it worked, because small operations, their cost for doing a facility upgrade can be anywhere from, from two to seven times as high as a larger facility. So if we're thinking you know, about Toledo, for instance, or a large facility, then a small, a small town has to pay anywhere between two and seven times per, per dollar, I'm sorry, two to seven times per gallon more than, than they would. So um, they, these, these guys here were willing to pay a lot to cheese factory to get this done. Um, and so we were remediating two milligrams per liter. Um, and this tells us the total amount. It wasn't all that much, but we did it. And um, so then the Soil and Water District got money. And so, so, much, so about the same amount for administration is actually the conservation measures, which then they, they paid the farmers. And then OSU had to get involved in it. We, so we got some money for doing this. And one of the reasons we, um, EPA, <laughs> Uh, the trust level wasn't all that high when we started, and so they, they wanted some kind of confirmation that, that this would really work. And so they insisted that we would do voluntary monitoring, which so we, went, we had sites, about 100 sites all over the watershed that we had to go out every other week and, and measure. But you know, really, they didn't, at the end of the, of the first five years, which is the first permit cycle, you know, we, had, we looked at these and go, well, what does this tell us about the success of the conservation measures that we put in? Did it really tell us anything? And it, the answer is no. Maybe in a couple of them, but, you know. But it's because they were hit and miss. I mean, you know, if you were right on top of where a conservation measure was put in, maybe it would tell you something. But for the most part, it didn't tell you that much. So, but this was actually, you know, the, the interesting thing was this is the, the permit, you know, a regulatory permit by EPA. And inside that it said that there were voluntary monitoring sites that you must do. Yeah, so voluntary monitoring sites that you must do. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure you heard that. Um, and, and so, um, so it cost all of this $300,000, didn't need to be there. That's part of the problem of price. But we, when we did the Muskegon plan, then later we were able to convince EPA that this was like a useless exercise here. Um, there is regular, I mean, mandated monitoring, which you would n normally do like above and below a point source. That's really, really logical. You know, see if the factory is really making an improvement. Or if there's ways to actually imp to check, to verify the improvement that, that, you know, that was made on a farm, uh, that'd be good too. And we do, we do our share of that. Um, we also then, when we first started, we said, well, rebates to the company. Was, let's say, if, what's happened? We had no idea that we'd be successful. So we sat around, the head of the company, uh, the chief factory, the head of the soil and water district, and me, and we go, well, let's create a partnership. I mean, we don't, none of us know what we're doing. So let's see what, let's, let's create a partnership. And if it works, then, you know, shouldn't the company get some kind of rebate or something? Um, 
if, if, if we put in conservation measures and they happen to be long term, because our, the plan's only for five years, but let's say that the conservation measure we put in is 10 or 20 years, well then shouldn't, if we pay for everything in the first five years, shouldn't the company get some of that back? It made sense. Yeah. So we said that too. And, but anyway, the program in the year um, 2010, we had, um, I don't know if anybody knows uh, Chris Yoder, he was with EPA. Uh, he has a company called Midwest Biodiversity Institute. For those students of mine that were out doing HHEI today, he was actually the creator of, he along uh, with Ed Rankin, creator of uh, something, uh, it was called the um, Q, QHEI, the Qualitative Habitat Evaluation Index, which is for a little larger stream, uh, HHEI is for, uh, for primary headwaters. But he came out with his crew and they did a study of it. And now it's in, uh, this, this down from the factory is in full biological attainment. So. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, you want to say, well, did it work? <laughs> did it improve the water quality in this case? Yes, it did. Um, it's very clear. Um, we worked with 25 farmers, installed 91 practices. We got, in, in by the year three, when we first started working, there most, of, most of them were Amish, and people said, well, they're Amish. I'm not sure if this is going to work, Richard. And so remember, I'm an anthropologist. I go, so what? <laughs> it's like, so what? They're Amish. You know? And so... Uh, so by it all of a sudden became very popular among the Amish, and we had a, a, a waiting list of people. That we, so by year three, we had everything in, we spent all our money, and done, you know. And then, of course, after we were done, and people said, well, you know, those were Amish. I don't know that you could do it somewhere else. <laughs> you know, you know, and, but then 21 counties came together, didn't they? So I guess, well, maybe you can convince other people to do it. So, you know. So anyway, um, these are all sort of the things that happen. All of a sudden, the, you know, the Soil and Water District in that county didn't have Amish attending because, remember, almost all of the Soil and Water Districts have their conservation measures from the USDA, and that's government money, and Amish don't want any government money. And so then all of a sudden they were working with them now because they were getting their conservation money from the, from the Chiefs Factory. And we worked with EPA on this. I mean, we, boy, we butted heads our good share. But you know, we you know we really uh, worked together and formed a nice team team relationship with EPA on this. And they're very proud, I think, of, of the project that they helped create. Um, and more of the same thing. Milk demand increased, and um, we helped the cheese industry there too. I mean, get a market niche and an area for uh, you know for high cheese quality. Um, <coughs> We've been recognized by some people. The best one we've been recognized by, we were a friend of conservation award by the local county soil and water district. That was the one I loved the most. And a lot of things, you know, like this sort of offshoots that are really nice, like farms hosting all the county fifth graders, you know, to come <laughs> stuff like that. And, um, so Alpine renewed uh, this last year uh, for the second permit cycle. So why did it work so well? I think part of it was that it was a small facility that could pay more. Soil and Water District was actually the, the very trusted entity in that county. Um, we did surveys to find out, like, who do you trust? <laughs> and they scored highest, um, even higher than OSU, which scored pretty high. Uh, university participation, neutral, authoritative. You know, we would be, if, if we found a better way, we'd be the first ones to tell them. I'd say, oh, well, here's something better than water quality trading. I'd tell them in a second. Um, we took a headwaters approach. Uh, I think that was important. Um, you know, farmers are... <laughs> Pretty logical people, you know, so they, they, they can get it. You know, okay, so do something, start in the headwaters and work down. Um, and the conservation measures were very often related to the milk, the, the, the dairy industry. Uh, and uh, we added local, local uh, uh, jobs, and so we improved the milk quality, can you believe that, and the herd health. And so everybody goes, well, why don't we do this sooner? Um, so I ended up in March and down subcommittee hearing on, on uh, water resources in the environment. So I tried to give them some common sense. <laughs> you know, what could you give con Congress some common sense? Good luck. <laughs> but anyway, I decided to try. And so uh, I said trading should focus on the headwaters. You know, we find that first order headwater streams uh, contribute approximately 70% of the mean annual water volume and 65% of the natural, uh, uh, nitrogen flux in second order streams. It goes downstream. So start up in the headwaters, common sense. Another one, common sense point number two, small wastewater treatment plant upgrades <laughs> cost more per dollar. For, and so you know, here was, you know, if you look at one, uh, uh, one that's less than one million gallons per day, 
and you had to get down to this level of phosphorus that cost you this much, and if you were going to look at one that's like, oh, even over 10 or 20, you know, it's just, it's just so much more uh, per, um, you know, dollars to, you know, or uh, much more per, uh, for doing per gallon uh, for, uh, for the small ones versus the large ones. I won't go into the math there. Here's just the basic points. These are called major and minor permits. So when you have more than 1 million gallons per day, it's called a major uh, wastewater treatment plant. And if it's less than 1 million gallons per day, it's called a minor. But just some basic things to think about. When you have a uh, major, it's more than 1 million gallons per day. Facility upgrade costs are low per gallon because of just the efficiency of the scale. But, and the transaction costs are low. A transaction cost is the cost of doing business. So, um, you may, like when I work with the City of Columbus Public Utilities, I'm working with people with, with um, PhDs and, and law degrees and things like that. They're really up on the latest policy. And they say stuff I have no idea. I have to go look up and stuff. And, <laughs> and, um, and they're usually downstream. They're big, a big city, often downstream somewhere. Not always. Like think of Toledo. It's downstream, right? So, you know, those, you don't find too many big cities up, upstream. You find more little cities, little towns upstream. Minor, less than 1 million gallons per day. Um, and the facility upgrade costs are high, high transaction costs, like in these small towns of like 500,000, 5,000 people. And, you know, it just takes a lot, you know, oh, you know, Sam's down there at the, you know, at Mildred's, uh, you know, hamburger, you know, shop, and, oh, we can get him back here. Let me call him up. Everybody knows everybody else, and they, um, and, and, and then, oh, why, why is the wastewater treatment plant? Oh, well, it's, it was, you know, Jed, the mayor's nephew, who, you know, had owned the land there, you know, and, and, and you get all this kind of big mix of, but on, there's a positive side to that, because you can sometimes get things done, but it, it's a, it's, it takes a lot of time uh, and explanation time and trying to make them change from that to something else. Um, they're sometimes open-minded, though, about how they go about things, so there's a, you know, if we can find a template that would work, maybe it'll, this will work, and that's my hope. And they're usually upstream. Not always, but often. Um, well, I just mentioned that already. Six to seven times as high when you know cost. So we did a study when we were looking at the Scioto watershed. Uh, of course, that goes into the Ohio Basin, not Lake Erie. But we just tried to use, tried to survey a number of different size of uh, wastewater treatment plants, and we and we asked different people that were related to that, uh, consultants and county commissioners and plant supervisors and so on. And you know, where, where, how would you um, upgrade your wastewater treatment plant? And 50% of them would float a 20-year uh, bond. 85% uh, would obtain a government grant. 10% increase taxes. 75% enter, enter into nutrient trading agreement to meet part of the upgrade. They were actually very open to this. 80% um, uh, said other rate increase, monthly service rates, industries in town pay fair share, so on. Um, so we were interested in, in Ohio, and we talked, talk, told them about the Alpine plan. We said, what, you know, what, what do you think about that? Would you, would you be interested in doing anything like that? And 50% said yes, uh, and then 25%, whichever is less expensive. Um, so, you know, but, you know, it's, it's sort of the doors, you know, at least partway open. Um, and then we said, would, would knowing that the county soil and water district office could be funded through the program make you more willing to participate in water quality trading? 100% said yes. This is around Delaware. For those of you like Delaware, this is the upper Scioto watershed near Columbus, right? Um, but not just Delaware. We did all those counties, the whole bunch of counties, like 12 counties. Um, would you consider a partial plant upgrade to, to get the phosphorus levels down uh, and then do nutrient trading? So, you know, pretty open to that, you know, and 75%. Uh, under Ohio water quality rules, we're talking about trading between a point source and a point source on a one-to-one -one basis. Would you consider lowering your wastewater treatment plant level below the EPA regulations to get a payment from downstream? Yes. They're open to that. So, you know, they're more open than I thought they'd be. That's good news, you know. Now, another common sense point three, you know, by there, you know, I think Congress gets pretty tired of me. But anyway, by three, uh, one, another interesting fact is at the county level, you've got the budget. The county commissioners control the budget of a soil and water district and the county wastewater treatment plant. So think about it. If you're a county commissioner, would you like this idea? Save money, right? Because you're having to pay both of them right now. And here you can save money on the one to pay the other. So that's another angle of this whole thing. 
And that's what Holmes County did. They, they, after we did Alpine, they went, hmm. And they immediately did, they started the one, the, the one of their wastewater treatment plant on it. Um, another thing we did is we, um, we asked um, ag, ag economists, uh, um, and they, wanted us to, they, they were promoting us to do something very simple. We said, wait, this is not the New York Stock Exchange. This is Holmes County. Um, and we only have about 30 point sources here. So um, can't, we, can't we make up a pretty complex thing? They just wanted to, first people said, dude, just price look. No, no, no. We want we to have a committee, and we'll sit down with you know, different people that apply for this, and we'll make a pretty complex thing with a point system, about 100 points. And we'll put, we'll put price in there, but we want all these other things in here because these local people can actually figure this all out. And so far, we, we have a technical, for the Muskegon plan, we have a, a technical uh, committee that actually will do this. Because if you think of a five-year five -year permit, right, and you've got 30 of them in your county, basically, then only six of them can come up in any given one year, right? So this isn't that, it's not the New York Stock Exchange. I have to, you know, sometimes get people and shake them up and say, it's not the New York Stock Exchange. This is local towns. <laughs> so... Common sense point four, this is where I'm sure Congress gave up on me. But anyway, economic development advantages of Alpine Cheese Factory far outweigh the cost of the program. It's not about cost dollars per pound necessarily. It's like, look at the larger picture, please. Think out of the box a little bit. Um, so all these other things were, were much more important than dollars per pound. We, uh, we've lowered bacteria levels. We fenced cows out of streams, because there were a lot of Amish cows in the stream. And the somatic cell count, which is the pus in milk, I'm sorry to tell you that there's pus in milk, but that's bacteria. And it went from 365,000 to 165,000. And that meant that they got 75 cents per hundred weight more, which is $22.50 per cow per year, because we lowered because when they have to sell their milk to the dairy, the dairy's happy to get lower somatic cell count because they can make more cheese from it. So a new Amish co-op that was formed actually then <laughs> took our ideas and then made it, instead of having just a, like a black and white kind of thing, like you have to be above this, they made a graduated scale based on all this. Um, so we were pretty happy with that. Um, we also you know, tried to really observe local culture when we did all of this. And so... The streams in Sugar Creek were, you know, they used them for religious purposes, for baptisms, and so we, you know, we, we um, very interestingly, this stream, these streams had the highest macroinvertebrate scores. Now I won't go any further, but <laughs> it's true. It's only an association for those of you who are doing statistics. Okay, how do you do it? Okay, and so here's how you might do it: find yourself a county, okay, and like a. I, oh, I, I'm not sure. What I, is it Crawford County? I hope I got the right one. Crestline. Uh, was that right? Crusaders in the middle there. And these are all the, um, you can go to the EPA site and just look for NPDES, and it'll show, it, you can go by county, you can go by permit, whatever, and it'll draw you a map of them all. There's a lot, see? I remember I said about 30. I don't know. I can't count them up. Maybe there's 20 or 30 here. And... <clears throat> So when we look at, this is EPA's uh, statistics on looking at the great uh, Lake Erie Basin of Ohio, and we look at uh, the, the, you know, the, the POTWs are, are wastewater treatment plants. So we're looking at those, the, the total number here versus the number um, subgroup of that that are greater than one, milligram, mil, um, one million gallons per day. These are the big, big guys, right, the majors. So here's two, this one, this, um, this, this is the HUC-8, which is a hydrologic, unit. It's a way of, of measuring watersheds. Um, and so, uh, so this one has two, which would be minors, because there's no majors, or no majors here. Here there's six minors and one major. Here there's 13 minors and one major. See how it works? So, and then you can, then it says here, estimated phosphorus load. Um, and so you have like a million tons. Um, and so then it comes up with a, a number down here. So that's a good way, you know, if you wanted to say, okay, you know, if we were looking for, you know, lots of, um, here's, here's a score pretty high, lower mommy. And here's another one, black, black rocky, and 
Cuyahoga, Ashtabula, and the surprises. And so then we'd say, okay, you know, if you're using my, my method, you're going to be looking for miners, right? Because miners are going to pay off, they're going to pay more for conservation measures. They can pay more for everything. So remember, because our cost per, 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 per gallon for facility upgrades is higher. So then we got, what, 37 of the miners that are here. Quite a bit of, you know, and very likely that, you know, they're, they're polluting. Now, here's a problem. Who's reporting? So you got like here in Auglaize, you got 58, but only, only half, less than half are reporting. And so, you know, EPA is way behind on their numbers. You know, they're, they're trying to catch up, and they're better than when they were in 2011, whenever this document was made. But, you know, long way to go. Here's 2011, see, so um, percentage of permits with phosphorus limits, see, only 30% in 2011 had phosphorus limits. So they're, you know, EPA is in the process of, of, of giving more permits to these, you know, but, you know, and, they, and they did, you know, you know, one of the reasons that the total phosphorus went down so much is they focused, of course, on the majors first, which they should have, you know, and, that's where most of the load comes from, uh, from these from the big from the big guys. But uh, there's a lot left to do in the small ones. So, and, we, and it's sort of haphazard. We come across the small ones, and they might or they might not have a. You know, but but EPA is gradually imposing the limits on all of them. So Richard says more permits with NMP needed, please. It's the you know the driver for water quality trading. It's it's not people you know. Alpine wouldn't have said, hey, step up. What's we want to do this just to be good, you know. They wouldn't have done it. You know, they were painted in a corner. It's like they had to do it, you know. And um, and they're really good citizens, you know. They really wanted, when we first looked at them, we said, geez, should we, should we help them or not, you know. And um, But everybody in the, in the town said, oh, they're really good. You know, they, they got, <laughs> nobody liked EPA, too. They, they said, well, they, they fought EPA. They've got to be good, you know. But anyway, <laughs> and so, <laughs> but, uh, so, you know, but here's what, a, here's what a permit looks like. You can go to the, the, the uh, uh, EPA NPDES website, and you can look up a permit of any given uh, 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 NPDES permit. And so here's the, the village of Crestline. It's, on the, it's in the Sandusky uh, wa uh, watershed. Anybody from Crestline? Nobody? Okay. Anybody near Crestline? Besires. Okay, Besires. Yeah, you were on the map of that last one, weren't you? Um, center of that map. I could have chosen Besires, but I didn't. Okay. Um, and so here's this permit number. We just all we have to do is just go to the that county. Was it was it so was I right that it was Crawford? Crawford yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, so we look at the permit, and it says that the permit has a design flow of 0 0.95 million gallons per day, which actually means technically it's a minor, but it's actually classified as a major because it's so close. Um, and they go over that sometimes. Um, so you look further down in the permit. Oh, and by the way, design flow. Why we're interested in design flow is to get to the issue of load, which means weight, pounds. And we're interested in remediating phosphorus pounds or kilograms. You measure that flow times concentration is the load. So you have to know how much flow is going through there. And then you got to know, okay, they're supposed to get down to one milligram, the concentration of one milli milligram per liter, but they're actually at what level? And then you can calculate, you know, what, they're, what they actually are doing and what they're supposed to be doing. So here we have their permit. Here's Crestline's permit, and we go down to phosphorus. Uh, okay, they're supposed to get down to one. And monthly, you know, they can have some fluctuations there, not just get the one. They have some variation. They're allowed, they're allowed quite, quite a bit of, of variation here, but they're ultimately supposed to get down to one. So then we go to do some more sleuthing around, and we go to the US EPA ECHO website, and we can see are they been good citizens or not. And here's phosphorus. Okay, we go back to 2011. They were 145 percent off, and they've gotten better. Here's 2012, they were down to 24% off, and it was 2013, they were 13% off, improving. Well, they were 100 there, though. But anyway, gradually improving. We don't have any data here, but we see in violation, in violation, in violation, lots of violations. Good candidate for our trading, water quality trading. You see them, EPAs, got them starting to paint them in a corner. Okay, so <laughs> that's one of the first ones we go to, right? So. 
And we look more, some of them are more, here we go, okay, how are they doing? 2014, <laughs> so the P, the P limit, remember they were supposed to be one, here's phosphorus, right? So, okay, well, here May, it was 3.38, okay, May, or it's at different times, so yeah, they're sort of, sometimes they got, it got below a couple times, but a lot of times they're above, to 7.3, ouch! So, anyway. So we know we got a we got we got a town here that'd be a good candidate for water quality trading, and we can go through. This is the, actually the, the calculation of how you actually figure out how many pounds. If it was it's something like this, right? We got a, a, a case of something like a million gallons per day kind of operation. Maybe let's say we're going to lower go to lower uh, two milligrams worth, and that was this many pounds per day or this many pounds per year. So that's what we know if we're going to do crest line at two. Okay, just some uh, the group I'm with, uh, and I'm lucky that you know, uh, Jeff and Chris have been helping us out a little bit. But some of the things that we're thinking about uh, proposing for uh, Lake Erie, sort of a, a, an experiment that we're going to try to do, and quite based on the success of the Alpines, since we've got one success case, is target nutrients. Um, you know, but through SWOT modeling these days, through modeling, we can actually determine locations of where. Uh, there's a con likely a concentration of nutrients of phosphorus and nitrogen. And in our study, I had a, a PhD student, Ina Shea, who's now hired by the California EPA, um, uh, and uh, she uh, uh, was able to find that 31% of the area contributed 50% of the nutrients in the Toyota watershed. So much of our present approach to conservation in ag has been, oh, USDA will sponsor all these different conservation measures, or do we have any takers? Well, it's quite different to target them. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, part of the reason we haven't been very successful is this, that. Target farmer groups. Well, not all farmers are the same. You've got renter, you know, 60% of the Corn Belt is rented land. Well, does somebody who owns land treat the land exactly the same way as a tenant farmer? Maybe pretty much, but somewhat different probably, too. So, you know, what kind of conservation measures for which group? Small watershed performance-based group rewards. So we think that maybe if we work with small groups in a small watershed and maybe reward them on the basis of improving their resource, that common small stream that they're all part of, that we can get a better performance. We also think that the crop consultants, many of the large farmers in the Corn Belt, um, have crop consultants come out and tell them how much phosphorus and nitrogen to put on their on their crops. One of the things we found in doing some research on this, when we, we talked to them, uh, the crop cons advisors, crop consultants advisors, uh, certified crop advisors, they, they um, sometimes they would mainly focus on, ni on nitrogen, but it just happened that the company that they often represented sold the, the, the fertilizer with a small percentage of, fertil of phosphorus that came with it. So they weren't focusing on the phosphorus at all, but it came along for the, with the package and it just kept loading more phosphorus. Um, and does anybody know, I have one person in here that might know, I think, when does a plant need the most phosphorus? Early in the season or late in the season? Hmm? Early? I'm guessing. No. <laughs> I'm wrong. Late in the season is when it really goes on. So, but anyway, um, so, and we're thinking reward these guys and reward the soil and water conservation and uh, district employees. Um, so right now they just work there, right? So maybe if you gave them an incentive, you know, maybe that would help. Um, out of the box solutions, you know, a lot of times water quality trading when it first started was just so based on this point source, non-point source. Well, as I pointed out before, economic development would sort of like trump the whole thing, right? So. Um, so why not try to think of other cases like, hmm, do we have anybody that might be motivated right now? Any big cities that you can think of on, in Lake Erie? <laughs> so um, maybe they're, you know, they're not in an, if they have their own MPDES permit, but that's not what we're talking about here, is it? We're talking about algal and drinking water. Hmm, sounds like another city, a big city I happen to know. Columbus. What's their problem? Nitrate. Well, they also have algal. <laughs> they have a pool of everything. So they've got algal in Hoover, and they've got nitrates in, in O'Shaughnessy and um, Griggs Reservoirs. So high nitrates coming from the farming community. Uh, so they're motivated, right? I mean, 
to do something about that, but it's outside the NPDES permit system. Something like the city of Fremont. What's Fremont's situation? Anybody know that one? High nitrates. They had to build, how much did it cost? $50 million or something like that? I forgot how much it cost. Something like that. It's a huge amount of money. The Fremont had to, had to build their own reservoir, pump water out of the Sandusky River that goes into Lake Erie, and put it into this reservoir when the nitrate levels were low. So when the nitrate levels were high from the farming community, then coming down the, the, the river, then um, it was above 10 milligrams per liter, which is the drinking water limit for nitrate, then they would have the water for drinking for, for Fremont. There's another motivator there. So there's lots of these kind of, of out-of-the-box solutions, believe me. Could you, could you, are there other interested groups that might want to come together on this? I think so. Um, so this is what, you know, one of the things that we're thinking about. I was mentioning before about different kinds of farming groups, like if you have a large farm, grain farm, GMO seed, high tenancy rate, level of education, Ina found that they like, they're more inclined to have conservation tiller and nutrient management as a, as a conservation method. They love, they would be really inclined to do that. If you had a sort of a general farm of maybe mixed kind of grain and some animals, maybe conventional seeds, not GMOs, and they have they they're mostly own they own most of their land and rent out and they, they don't rent very much. They'd be much more interested in long term rotation and cover crops. We found this through our own just having small groups of farmers talk about this. Um, if they have a high level of education and their grain farms, we found that edge of field practices were con they they like that. So different kinds of, of groupings like this that we found that maybe our approach isn't hasn't been the smartest one that's out there. We could, there's a lot of, of, of possibilities for improvement of how we approach the farming community. Well, there's a lot of theoretical issues that challenge water quality trading. This is my last slide. Uh, so transaction costs, how do we keep the transaction costs low, especially if we're working with small uh, wastewater treatment plants? How do we, and the same thing would go for farms, large farms versus small farms. Um, what should be the right size for a, a water, of, of a watershed? Uh, you know, when you do uh, the kind of, of uh, carbon trading, um, you know, like CO2 and that kind of, and greenhouse gases on that level of like the Kyoto Protocol, you could go anywhere in the world. You know, you could trade with China to get, uh, you know, greenhouse gas emission credits. And, uh, but in and, and water quality trading, it has to be within a watershed. But what's the right size for a watershed? Is it just Lake Erie or should, should we think about the whole Great Lakes, all of the Great Lakes? Most of the water comes from the other, other Great Lakes. Um, so that's a big question. Um, where do we start? I think headwaters. Uh, I think it's easier to make the argument when you start with headwaters and move down. But, you know, maybe not. Um, this idea of a collective ownership of a, of a stream or a section of a, of a river makes a lot of sense, too. Um, who should be the broker? Who should be the one that arranges the trade? Should it be a soil and water district or, or just, should we just say community-based or or maybe not. Maybe it should be, you know, some other um, um, independent uh, broker. Uh, cost. How important is cost? Cost is obviously an important thing, but how important should it be? How should we target the nutrients? And, and uh, last, most nutrient pollutions happen during rain events. <laughs> this is where, you know, me, yeah. I'm, I'm there at Congress, right? The last thing, because it starts off with a Republican who says, the Imperial Obama administration, blah, blah, blah. And I go, oh, no, why am I here? And, I've got, and the Democrat, you know, so the Republican, the Democrat gets the last word. You know. He said something, and he goes, there, oh, by the way, are there any last questions? And I went, oh, I shouldn't have done that. But I did. And so, and so I said, uh, one problem with this is that water quality trading is based on TMDL, total maximum daily loads. And this is something in EPA policy that's basically based on low flow. And most pollution happens during rain events. And he said, what's that? I said, big rains. <laughs> and <laughs> that's a problem for water quality trade. It's, it's a, a frontier. So that we haven't really fully addressed that. So with that, then, the last, <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Richard, I've got one off yeah. the bat. The, uh, 
the, the ultimate effectiveness of it, was it, act, was it calculated or was it actually measured, like did you, did you really see the calculated reductions by concentrations in the stream going down or load coming out of the stream? Was, it, was, it, was that measurable? In Alpine? Yeah. In Alpine, um, it was measured biologically. I mean, that was, um, and so we measure, we measure in-stream as well. Um, and um, I don't have the number offhand of what the in-stream was. It, it, I have the data, but I just don't remember what it is. It's in, our, it's in one of my studies. I can show you Chris Yoder's uh, study on it. But, but it was biologically based, meant most of it. I mean, it was, it was um, IBI kind of stuff. I mean, that, that okay. kind of, yeah. But you, you, you know, you, it would seem that the the amount of reduction that they wanted uh, had to be a reason for it. You know, they were expecting to see a certain biological improvement. Yeah. And you made the trading. Yeah, they started off, they had indexed it before we started. Okay. And so they, they, they had it at a, a, a sort of a, medi a mediocre level. And, it, you know, it wasn't, it was, I think there were four things, and it was like decent on two of them, poor on two or something. And it, so that now it's in full biological attainment. Okay, so it really worked then. You know. From that point of view, the, the middle fork of Sugar Creek, next to the next to where the factory is, and mostly through the factories. On remember, the factory did most of the of the improvement just through their facility upgrade, and and we were actually a lot of our credits came from outside that stream, but um, they allowed us to actually in, in this case get a lot of the credits from another neighboring streams around there, but um, not the middle fork, but. Um, but we you know we 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 go out and measure at all these different sites, and we can see improvements. Yeah, so. Very good. Richard, you, you've got a track record of success now. So, are people? Do you feel like people are starting to come to you to get these to go on? Or are yeah. you spending a lot of time snooping, snooping through EPA data, and identifying possible target locations? Oh no, we 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 haven't got anywhere of that kind of interest. Like you know, like like point sources coming to us or anything like that. Um, you know, there was interest from the Great Lakes Commission that that has, they have a project over um, um, on the Fox in Lake Michigan, the Fox River, uh, uh, and um, Green Bay, and, 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 um, and so uh, they, they were asking people that have done water quality training to give webinars, so I gave a webinar and talked, I've been working with them a little bit, but, um, and, you know, just like the national thing, just going to Congress, but, so there's interest in it at that level, but not, you know, uh, I don't have mind to windfall people coming to, in fact, in the Muskegon plan, you know, we're getting approval for, we're having a rough time finding, you know, point sources to get it kicked off. We don't have any problem with the farmers, really, in that, in that watershed. Mm -hmm. Now, here, maybe in this one we will. I don't know. We haven't gone there yet. I just don't have a good sense of it yet. In, the, in that watershed, I'm 100% confident that we can, we can get, get farmers like that, but not just on each one. But, um, and, but um, we're having trouble finding point sources to come to the table. Part of the problem is that many of the point sources that we're working with um, put alum into in, and you know which creates sludge and um, and the cost for alum it, you know we're uh, we can do it pretty much for twenty dollars a credit and that's sort of where the alum is coming in so we're almost even with what they're doing so if we could get some extra funding I just haven't had time to go over to the Muskegon Conservancy District to see if they because they got like a windfall of money from selling water to to the the hydro fracking industry, but anyway, um, and I was thinking of going to them. Um, I mean, they're big supporters of our program, and seeing if they could just give us a little bit of money that would tip the scales on this thing. Um, but that's where we are with that one. Gubisberg cheese, we think, will probably come on. Oh, really? We're working with them. Very good. Thanks again, Richard. Yeah. Thank you.